One of the major problems to being a Christian is the fact that Christianity uh, often involves a risk. Y'all believe that at all? I mean, you risk your job, you risk your personage, you risk your neighbors, your friends, uh, maybe your investments, maybe your money, who knows? Because once you give your life to God and say, Lord, let me be yours and use me to your best will, well, there you've gone and opened it up, opened the door, haven't you? In fact, I had one lady who attended church here years and years ago. And she said she didn't want to get too close to God because she was afraid he would ask her to do something she didn't want to do. Wow. Sadly, I told her you'll probably never be close to God with that attitude. But Christianity is a risk, isn't it? All of life is a risk. You get on an airplane, you guys aren't flying, are you? Well, how many of you feel? Ooh. I've flown planes my whole life, and every time I get on one, boy, does my prayer life get strong. And Lord, don't let this sucker fall out the sky. You get in your car, and you're driving down the interstates, and you know, five lanes of everybody going like, like this. And then Channer's in part of that mix. And Gary will tell you all about risk when he rides with me. Everything is risk. In fact, I love Marv Levy. Remember him? He used to be the coach of the Buffalo Bills or whatever. He had a classic line. He said, all life is a risk. Of course football is a risk. You can get hurt any one play in any one game. Your career is done. You're selling apples. He said, all of life is a risk. Michelangelo, if he didn't want to take a risk, he would have painted the floor of the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> Way to go, Marv. All of life is a risk. How many of us believe that? Well, the disciples were in a boat. They had spent the day with Christ. He was doing all his fine teaching and, you know, the Sermon on the Mount and all that great stuff. The promises of God, the promises of God's power, the love, the forgiveness, the whole nine yards, right? They were loving it. And Jesus says, it's getting late. Let's go to the other side. What they're talking about is the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is not really a, a sea, so to speak. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it or been there. It's about 12 miles long and maybe two miles wide. A mile and a half, two miles wide. So, yeah, you could get in a little sailboat and sail over there in, you know, 30, 40 minutes. And he did that many times. He, he left Israel, sailed across the lake to what is now the Golan Heights, or um, in that time, Syria, the cities of the Decapolis. That's where all the, the nasty people went. They were literally the first uh, sanctuary cities. If you committed a crime in Israel and could get to one of those sanctuary cities, then you were free of your crime. But the problem was you could never leave those cities. You had to stay there for the rest of your life. Because the minute you step back into Israel, then they're going to kill you. So you can imagine what the Decapolis cities were like. All the best people of the world were there. No, all the robbers, murderers, crooks, thieves, zealots, they hung out there. And Jesus often went over there and worked with them. So anyway, he's talking to his boys. He says, guys, let's, it's been a long day of teaching. They're in Capernaum, the Sermon on the Mount. Nice day, nice countryside, you know, nice people, had a great lunch, fed thousands. They got in the back of the boat and he said, let's go over to the other side. Well, Jesus is exhausted, obviously. And he falls asleep in the back of the boat. And the other guys are, you know, trying to get the little sail up. They had one little sail on those boats. And they're probably trying to row as well and get through there when a giant storm comes. And, of course, now you got a problem. Sail, bad idea in a big storm. You take that down, generally. Otherwise, it blows your boat over and it sinks. 
So take down the sail. They're trying to fight the waves. Bing, bang, boom. There's 12 of those guys shoved into this little boat. Remember, we're not talking about any kind of big ship here. We're talking about a little fishing boat. And Jesus is asleep in the back. How is that possible? How many of you ever slept on an airplane? That's impossible because you're... And you know darn well it's going to crash. So you better stay awake just in case. So you can yell, oh no, we're going to crash. Boats are the same way. Little boats. Who sleeps on a little boat? Nobody. Jesus is asleep. Isn't that wonderful? And his boys get a little scared. Now remember, half these guys were fishermen. On that same lake. Their whole life. So it must have been one heck of a storm. Think about it. For them to say, "Uh uh-oh, this is not good. Carol can tell you some good stories about sailing with me. We almost took a half a million dollar boat to the bottom. Because I left the blonde in charge. Bad idea. (laughs) That's another story, another sermon. But it was a dangerous setting, a dangerous situation. And the boys woke up Jesus and he says, Lord, don't you care? Now listen, I'm going to tell you all the truth. And if you don't learn anything else from me in the whole many years I have preached, learn this. When you get to heaven, don't ask God, don't you care? That's a stupid question. Look at Jesus' response. He looks at the wind, he looks at the waves, huge storm, howling, splashing, boat pitching left and right every which way, guys scared to death. He said, be still. Wow. And he looks at his men and he asks them, how is it you're so timid and afraid? How's that possible? How is it you lack faith? You know, when he says you lack faith, what he's really saying is you don't believe enough to alter your life. And you don't believe enough because you probably don't understand enough. And even though you've been next to me for three years, you monkeys still ain't figured it out. How is it that you're so afraid? You're going to live your whole life afraid. Powerless, subject to any whim and wave that comes along. And yet, right here in the back of the boat is a son of the living God. I would ask that question too. They asked, don't you care? He asked, how is it? You're so afraid. You know, if I were standing in a crowd, even a tumultuous situation, if Jesus were standing next to me... I probably wouldn't sweat it. You know? If Johnny were standing next to me, I'd say, move over, big boy. (laughs) But if Jesus were standing next to me, the Son of God, who has healed and walked on water and fed thousands and raised from the dead, I probably wouldn't sweat it. I'm really relying on that John passage. When you die, Jesus will come and take you there himself. I'm not walking into heaven by myself. But if Jesus is next to me, yeah, we're tight. (laughs) And that's basically the question Jesus is asking his men. What you've seen, what you've heard, what you've witnessed. How is it? You're still just a dried up little old bean in a boat. You got all the power of God right next to you. You know what? The guy still didn't figure it out. Mm -hmm. He said, stop, hush. Everything stopped. And they went, ooh, who is this that even the wind and the water obey? Here's the answer. God. The power of God, the same power that Jesus said, what I've done, you will do, and more so. Jesus is only here for three years. You got a whole life. You ain't a dried little bean, not if you soak yourself in the Spirit. 
you're going to puff up. You're going to get powerful. You're going to be three times as big as you were. You're going to be a force to be dealt with. In the Lord's sense, in a positive way. If you will allow yourself to be. Unfortunately, the churches these days, for the most part, we're in the bean business. We got a whole church load of beans. Sadly, they're dry. Why would God tell us this story? There's no teaching here. There's no nothing here other than God saying to His men and women, uh, the people in that boat who witnessed all of His ministry, how is it you're still afraid? How is it you have no faith? The Son of God sitting right next to you and you're sweating a storm. Come on, fellas. The problem is they were dried beans too. They were dried beans. You know, an old theologian once said, it's kind of a cute little... He says, remember Pentecost when the Spirit came down like tongues of fire over the heads of the people? Remember that? Acts chapter 2. The old theologian said, we don't need a tongue of fire over us. We need to put some fire under us. That's what Christians need today. A fire under them, not a fire over them. Soak them in the Spirit and light them ablaze. The problem is they lacked faith, they lacked understanding, and the fact that they what they saw, what they witnessed, and what they knew never made the jump to being a life-altering force. They were the same old timid, afraid, faithless guys as ever. And Jesus said, how is it? After having seen what you've seen, experienced what you experienced, how is this possible? And they're still worried about, oh, this guy commands the wind and waves. You're not getting it, fellas. You know Mount Rushmore? Everybody been to Mount Rushmore? It's a big rock up in South Dakota where they carved the faces of the presidents on it. Uh, I don't know if you all know this, but when it gets real hot and dry in the summer, it does it get real hot and dry up there. And they go like 130 degrees and all this for weeks and weeks. Those big giant rocks start to crack. And they get little fissures in them. Just little, some of them micro fissures, some of them bigger. But they're everywhere. So every year they get guys on, you know, ropes and scaffolds and that stuff. And they got to go up there and they make this mix. Kind of a latex sort of half cement, half latex kind of goo. And they go up there, and you don't know this, but they spend most of the summer trying to fill these little cracks because otherwise rainwater will fall in there. And then when the winter comes on, it'll freeze. Well, what do you know about water when it freezes? It expands. And old, you know, Lincoln's nose is going to boom one of these days. So they're up there rubbing his nose. Trying to fill even the little tiny, oh, that little crack in this giant mountain won't matter. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. You got to fill those voids, fill those cracks, fill those little chinks in your armor, so to speak. So that when you're faced with tribulation and turmoil, you'll stand as strong and as, uh, as assured as ever. There won't be any, how is it? You've seen what you've seen. You've been bathed in the Spirit of God. I promised never to leave you or forsake you. And yet here you are afraid. You know what the problem is? We're dry beans. We ain't no big fat puffed up bean. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the power of God. We're a little withered up, dried bean, a little statue with a few cracks in us, and that ain't going to get better. Unless we start soaking ourselves in the Spirit and rub it, filling all those cracks. Unmeaningful lives. People walk through their whole life thinking, well, I would never really accomplish nothing. I wish I could have done. Wish I could have been better in my family. Wish I could have been a better spouse. Wish I could have been a better. What are you saying? Well, I'll tell you what you're saying. You're saying, uh, Jesus really doesn't have any impact in my life. But you go to church every Sunday. Yeah, but. There's no yeah, but. 
Either Christ is in your life, the power of God is surrounding you as He promised, not us. Or it's not. If it's not, whose fault is it? It's El Huapo. <laughs> whose fault is it? It's ours, the age-old expression. If God seems a, a, a bit distant, who moved? When is your faith going to make that jump, make that leap into a life-altering existence? I love Paul. Oh, Paul. He didn't start off so good, but he, he shined up pretty well. There he was facing his own death, getting ready to cut his head off. And he writes to the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice. Even though I'm ready to be poured out like a drink offering. Rejoice in the Lord. I don't know that I'd have been saying that. Guys out there sharpening up his axe. He says, for me to live is Christ. If I die, that's gain for me. Then he goes on to say, I'm hard pressed. I don't know which way to go. If I die, I go home and be with God. If I live, well, then I, it will be for your sakes. So that you can know the Lord as I know the Lord. Who can stand before the axe guy and say that? Paul could. You know why? Because he was not a dried bean. He was a big old fat bean. <laughs> Unmeaningful, unpurposed lives. Oh, Tom, yes, yeah, pretty critical. Look at the people around you. Look at the people at work. Listen to them at lunch. Go to lunch one day and don't say anything. Just listen. The misery, the sadness, the oh, woe is me. And you're finally going, come on. Yeah, everybody has a few waves in their life. Everybody goes through a few storms in their life. But the boat is still floating and you're still fine. And by the way, you got the Son of God sleeping in the back of this thing. So don't sweat. Don't sweat the waves. A woman named Julie Gronseth. I was reading her a little bit of autobiography. Uh, she went to a little town called Elkhorn, Wisconsin. Now, this was years ago, back in the 40s. Elkhorn, Wisconsin. Has anybody ever been there? I can honestly say I do not know where that is. But anyway, at that time, it was a small town of about 500 people. Uh, today it's probably a huge city, but in that day and age, it was a small town. And she went there, and to her surprise, she went to look for a church. But at the time, there were no working churches there. There were church buildings from, you know, the days of yesteryear, but there were no churches with active ministers or ministries or worship services. So she decided that she was going to go and, and she went door to door and visited as many people as she could. And she asked them, would they all be interested in coming down to the church and trying to revitalize it and get this started again? And that she would be, she would act as a leader until they could find and, and, and bring a young pastor in to help them reestablish the spiritual uh, lives there in Elkhorn. And she decided to do this. Well, at first everybody's kind of, oh yeah, I'm busy. I got beans to harvest. Well, she started bringing meals to people, even though they didn't ask for them. She started visiting people over and over again, especially the older, the elderly. And she started taking little goodies to them and their kids and trying to get stuff for their kids. She just made it her life's mission that she's going to minister to this little town of people regardless. And she did this for seven years before they finally had a worship service whereupon most of the people were there. Maybe out of gratitude, I don't know. But she was saying, you know, this is not going to be a meaningless town. With no representation, no presence, no acknowledgement, and no worship of God. God was important to her. Always had been, since she was a little girl. 
And amazingly enough, the people came to the little church and they started imitating, if you will, her. Just like Paul said, be an imitator. What I've done, do. As I've cared for you, care for one another. As Jesus said, as I've loved you, try and work it out between. And the little church became vital. She caught a very bad uh, blood disorder, uh, infection in her blood. And just like in, within a week's time, she died. Just like that. She came into the village. She worked with this little town. She got them all excited about God. Got them all back to the house of God. And then she was gone. They found some of her writings, and this is a little piece that they actually published after her death in, in honor of her at her funeral when they were burying. Oftentimes in life, the storms rage and we find ourselves crying out. And later we discover that God was at work the whole time, even when we thought he was asleep. Christ sleeping in the back of the boat. Sometimes we experience something beautiful and something so amazing that later, upon recollection, we term it as a miracle. Or God's merciful works. When all along, He was always there. Oftentimes we find that strength for the journey Love and prayers and the support of family and friends, they all become representative of God's presence. The kindness we bestow to one another in the simplest of things. Miraculously, we come to, the, to discover that God has given us perfect peace even in the most painful of situations. A woman with a blood disorder would know that. Sooner or later, we discover that even though the storm rages, regardless of how intense it becomes, God is still there. And out of the grueling experience, we have the opportunity to come forth with a more mature faith. We must be weary of becoming fearful like the disciples did in the storm with Jesus. They were filled afterward with great awe. And they even said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey? What they did not realize, that the one who the wind and the sea obey is the one in their presence, calling them brothers and friends. I'm always amazed, she writes, how often after someone has come through a terrible ordeal, they even come to the place in their life where they can express appreciation for the experience. Wow. Wow. Gee, thanks God for that miserable poem. Paul said three times, or five times, I was beaten with 39 lashes. Christ got it once. Five times. Paul said after that, he wrote that three times I was beaten with metal rods. Then he writes, once I was stoned and left for dead. He must have been pretty mashed up. You get a mob out there heaving rocks. They're not going to want to quit until that sucker's dead. He must have been a mess. Then he writes, But I count all things that I've ever known, that I've ever done, every experience, good and bad. I count all things as loss next to knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Who do you think sitting in the back of the boat? The Son of the Living God, who, by the way, He promised never to leave us or forsake us. Why are you still a dried bag of beans? 
The power is within you. Just soak yourself in His Holy Spirit. Fill your heart, fill your mind, fill your soul with the power, presence, and awareness of God. Go ahead, sharpen your axe. If I die, I go home to Jesus. If I live, I'm going to help you know Him the way I know Him. But do you know Him? Why are you so afraid? Someone who knows the Lord should not be timid and afraid. How is it you have no faith after you've seen all that you've seen? Here's this one little event teaching an incredible lesson. You're standing and sitting in the very presence of God and you're afraid. How is that possible? How is that possible? Yeah, life's a risk. Big deal. Plenty of risks out there. And we will take them. And we will make them. And our families will make them. And our children will make them. Because life is a risk. That's why Jesus said, don't fear the world. I've already overcome it. And know this. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. In other words, I will always be in the back of your boat. Always. How is it you're still a dried bag of beans? You know, a 184 foot boat sank because of a bag of beans. That's what a bean can do once it's soaked long enough. Once you're bathed in the Spirit of God, you can release a force that can sink ships. Wow. I'd like to see the captain explain that. Let us pray. Father, as we enter this new year and we face, yes, all manner of trial, let us walk forth proudly unafraid. Let us walk forth assuredly in full awareness that your Son, Jesus Christ, walks before us. Father, help us be the power that God promised. Help us be and make that jump from knowing of God to living in God. And help us do all that Jesus said we would do. And even more so. Father, manifest yourself in a most real way to everyone here. Then we will be the church of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.